But if God has done something wonderful, marvelous, made a way, see, I'm doing this now so you don't feel any pressure with offering, but made a way where you didn't think that there was any way, and God made a way for you, I want you to get up here right now. I need, if I'm not going to do any more than, than three. Real quick, hurry. Anybody? Anybody? God, God has made a way for you and you didn't think there was any way. Huh? Get up here. Get up here. I want, you, I want to hear from you. Oh, God. God, let you with them. There's just one of three. God made a way for you and you didn't think there was a way. Come up here. Come on up. I don't know if he's playing or if he's drunk in the spirit. What's God done for you? Well, recently I lost my job and there's I have an issue with life insurance that actually went up and somehow the Lord made it possible that we just took away from here and put over here and all of a sudden I, I've had uh, the amount of money I needed that if something happens to me that my wife is taken care of. God made a way. Oh, um, to the grace of God, I'm seven months sober today. Amen. Oh, 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 come here, come here. That's time to celebrate right there. He didn't think he could do it on his own. He didn't think he had prayer. What happened? God showed up. God showed up. Touched his life. He's never been the same. Good. That's good. Come here, sis. Today's my birthday. Gonna add it another year. Add it another year. Amen. Come here, Uncle Jim. Come on. Testimony meeting time. Well, here. Let me come down there. I, I'm in. You all right? Yes, sir. I just myself. I've got to believe he'll win through God. And I know that it'll take time to get rid of this mess. But I'm working on it. I'm fighting on it. God's promised me. And I'm going Amen. big. Amen. Amen. Not going under. You're going over. Praise God. Now, you can't break line. You can't break line, Paula. You rule breaker, you. You come here. You, Paula's a Look at her and say, Paula's a rule breaker. Paula knows I love her. That's why I call her 
a rule breaker and everything else. He knows I love her. I just want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I praise Him, I thank Him, I exalt Him. It was a couple of years ago, I was like down in the dumps, um, ready to crawl in a hole. I had lost my joy, and I had lost myself. I wanted to find myself, and God says, not to worry, I am with you always, even to the end, and He has brought my joy back. I'm alive again, I'm new. The sun is shining, it's a new day, it's a new morning, and I just want to thank him today for giving all praise and all glory. And I saw a miracle this past week. My niece, they said she went to walk for two, about approximately two months to two years, and she is walking, she is home, and she is blessed. Somebody give the Lord praise. Come on. I want to thank Chris the Lord that I'm walking today. I was told a year ago this month that I may never walk again. I can walk. And I thank the Lord for it. And then back in the summer, I'm sitting in the swing in the background of the parent room. Jack had talked about it. We didn't know it was going to last very much longer. And I said, Lord, let it just last as long as we can get some money to fix it. And one day, he was sitting there. I knocked on the door. This guy came in and he said, Can I look at your room? He looked at me. I got a brand new book and I also put it in the side. Free of charge. He made a way. He made a way. Come on, let's bless the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Anybody else? We're going we to finish up here in a minute. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless you, Father, Son.
the church as a whole. Now let me suggest to you that the greatest problem facing the church today is not the uh, gang problem that's on the outside. That's not the greatest problem that the church faces today. Nor is the greatest problem the drug pusher on the outside. Nor is the greatest problem we have in the church the moral values of society and the ungodliness of society. That's not the biggest problem, nor unrighteousness or darkness on the outside. Not even sin on the outside is the, heart, is the most troubling problem that the church has today. I want to suggest to you that the greatest problem facing us today is not what's going on on the outside, but rather what ain't going on on the inside of the church. We've taken on the mindset of the Laodicean church, which was neither hot nor cold concerning the things of God. And they went about their usual routine of doing things. In fact, uh, the fact of this matter is that they were in such a state that the Lord himself said that because they were neither cold nor hot, that he would literally spew them out of his mouth. And the problem is that our lukewarm churches of today are rapidly becoming a nausea which grieves the heart 
of God. Now, here's a picture of far too many Christians in the world today. Far too many Christians. You know, years ago, uh, whenever I was a kid, we used to sing a song called Onward Christian Soldiers. How many of you remember that song? Onward Christian Soldiers Marching As to War. And, 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 uh, and now we don't sing Onward Christian Soldiers. Uh, we, we wait to be drafted into the service. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. We used to sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. But we don't use the ones that we have to praise and worship the Lord. Uh, serve the Lord with gladness. We, we used to say that. We used to, we used to quote those types of things. Serve the Lord with gladness, yet we complain when someone asks us to do anything. To prevent ourselves from falling into this category, we need to change the mindset about the church, God's church. And it's time that we, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for the church, move from a state of survival into a state of revival. Can somebody say amen? amen. I hear your stories. I hear your cries. I see your Facebook posts. And many of you are just in what I call survival mode. Just dredging out another day. Just waiting for it to be over. Just, just, just waiting for, for the other shoe to drop. And may I tell you, you're not living. You're just existing. You're just surviving from one day to the next. Am I talking to anybody here today? I mean, you're just merely surviving. You have just got the whole hums and the and the and the and the mully grubs and this that and everything and everything is the glass. You know, is always half empty and uh, and you don't have nothing good to say about nothing and and you're just you're just down and out and uh, and you're in a state of survival and the best testimony that you can give is that, well, praise God, one of these days the rapture is going to take place. May I tell you something? I'm glad that the rapture is going to take place, but just to look at, uh, and wait for the rapture is not really living. That's just survival mode. I want to tell you something. You can be in a state of revival and really live right now while waiting for Jesus to come. Somebody clap your hands and bless the Lord if you believe that today. And that's what the church is doing as a whole. It's surviving. It's a, it's a mentality that says, oh boy, well, we don't know. You know, it sure ain't like it used to be. Well, you know, look at this and look at, well, the crowds ain't like they used to be. And, and, and I understand what they're saying, but hey, look around today. We had six inches of snow last night and probably 130, 140 people here today. No, maybe church ain't like what it used to be, but can I tell you that if you will move from a state of survival and say, oh Lord, will thou not revive me again? I'm telling you, you can move from survival into revival. Can somebody say amen? amen. But, but, but by and large, we have a survival mentality in the church, living week to week, wondering if we're going to make it, wondering if our if our job is going to be there, wondering if our well, wondering if our uh, if our finances are going to stretch, and if we're if we're going to make it, and it's it's like that in our home and, and everything else. And, and the thing is, is that you're neither hot nor cold. You see, on one side, you really love God with all of your heart. Let me preach here for a while if I can. You really love God, and you believe that God can, but will God do it for me? And you live on this one side, and you say, well, you know, you know, I, I really love God. But then you live on this other side, you got, you know, you're in the world, and not of the world, but in the world every day. And you say, man, it's getting tougher and tougher. I, I know God can, but will He? And as a result of that, while you really love God, you're still in a state of survival, and therefore you're not really hot, and you're not really cold. You're just kind of there in the middle, lukewarm, and that's what God hates worse than anything is a mossy bank, lukewarm Christian. Amen. Lukewarm, operating at room temperature, unenthusiastic, nonchalant, just simply surviving. And because of our lukewarm, narcosis-like attitude, things toward the things of God and attitude that way, we find many, many vacant seats in the pews today. But I came by to let you know that God has called the church to do more than just barely get by and barely survive. I wish somebody would bless God. God has called the church to do more than just exist. He wants us to move from a place of survival into a place of revival. Now, how many of you will believe that with me 
today that it's not the will of God for us to be lukewarm and complacent, but God wants us to do more than just survive it from week to week to week. But God really wants us to thrive and be in revival, not only as a church, but as individuals. It is the will of God for you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So get rid of the stink. This ain't in my notes, honey. They may run me off after today. Get rid of the stinking thinking that has polluted your mind and that has clouded your mind and square your shoulders back and stick your head up high and say, bless God, I'm a child of the King Royal Blood. It's flowing through my veins. I've got to do more than just survive. I've got to do more than just get by. successful, there are some concepts that we must grab hold of. Jesus shows us here in our text that there is a job to be done. There is a need that must be fulfilled. I believe that Jesus is telling us here that there is a need for some workers. Got four hand claps. Five, thank you. I said there's a need for workers. There's, I don't, that's about a half of you that got. I said there is a need for workers. There is a need for laborers. There is a need for folks who are willing to get their hands dirty for the cause of Christ. There is a need for people to roll up their sleeves and put their shoulder to the plow and say, we ain't going under, we're going over for the cause of Christ. I'm sick and tired of being in survival mode. I've got to get in revival mode. Amen. Because we, listen, listen, and, and the scripture tells us here that he is looking for laborers. He, he says, pray ye that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest. You see, in this, he doesn't talk about how bad the harvest is. The harvest is going to be there each season perpetually. What he talks about is the real problem is the need for laborers. Praying, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers. So I've already come by here today to tell you this. There's some people say, well, if I just knew what to do. Well, I, I would, but I, I just don't. I, I. I've used this illustration years ago. Now, you may disagree with me, and that's, that's okay. That's your prerogative. But if I saw, and if you saw a burning house over here and knew that there was little children in it, you wouldn't have to fast and pray, Oh, God, what should I do right now? Lord, if it is your willeth that I goeth inside of there and try to find those little children, God, would you let it just begin to rain dewdrops out of heaven on my spirit and on my soul right now? Lord, I'm waiting on you to tell me what to do. Can I tell you something? The minute you see the burning building, and you may not be able to get in there, but at least you can call 911. And if you can get in there at all, you're at least going to go, if there's any compassion in you at all, you're going to go and you're going to see what you can do. Why is that? Because the burning building is the call to do something. That is the call to action. You may not can get in, but you can call 911. You can do something uh, to, to help make that situation better. Can I tell you something? The need is the call. Somebody say amen. The need is the call. And some of you are so so hyped up wanting to get your own ministry and this, that, and the other going on and everything else. You say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to tell me what to do. Well, look around your church. Amen. I said, look around your church. The need is the call. There are, we need laborers in this harvest. And so I've come by today to tell you that Jesus has already got his eye on you. That Jesus is already looking at you. Amen. Everybody in the world today is looking for some Somebody. 
major corporations that are looking for college graduates with marketable skills. Hospitals are looking for medical students and, and scientists who have graduated at the top of their class because there's a need. Financial institutions are looking for individuals that have an MBA and top-notch portfolios to, to help them with their strategies. The Marines are looking for the few and the proud. Amen. The Army is looking for all of those who are willing to be all that they can be. The Navy is looking for people who want not just a job but an adventure. The Air Force is looking for those who want to aim high. Everybody is looking for somebody. You got men looking for women. You got women looking for men. Unfortunately, in some cases, you got men looking for men and women looking for women. But I digress. Everybody's looking for somebody. And because we're living in such perilous times, because we're living in such a messed up world, there is much to be done when it comes to the kingdom of God. And therefore, uh, he's saying, I'm looking for laborers in this harvest. You say, well, can God use me? God can use you. Well, will God call me? God will call you. Bless God. If you can't do anything else, just bend over and pick up a piece of scrap paper and throw it in the trash. Give somebody at the grocery store line. A God bless you and Jesus loves you. I mean, God is still looking for a few good men and for a few good women. The Lord is looking for some. You better help me while I preach or I may not leave this point today. He's looking for somebody who's willing to give their all. He's looking for somebody to help in the harvest of the lost. The Lord is looking for somebody who will labor in the kingdom that lost men, women, boys, and girls will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. But what constitutes a willing laborer? What separates him from everybody else? How do I make sure that I'm doing my part in the move from the seats to the streets? Well, the text that I read you this morning gives us three points to consider. Let's look at them right now. First thing we've got to do is we've got to recognize the task. Notice the real issue here. Verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, there's a lot that needs to be done, but there ain't enough workers to do it. What kind of workers, preacher? I'm glad you asked. The harvest. Now, the word harvest comes from the Greek word therismos, which means to reap, to gather, to collect. It means the produce, the product, the yield, the people, the sheep, the lost, the hurting, the unloved. Now, I don't claim to be an agricultural major, but the last time I looked, harvesting was done outside of the building. Harvesting is done out in the fields. So that suggests that we've got to go outside of these four walls in order to get into the fields so that we can reach others. Let me put it like this. We need to get off of our blessed assurance. Get out into the highways and hedges and compel men and women and boys and girls to come to Christ. Do you believe that today? Now I'm gonna show you what the problem is. Here's the problem. The problem is we're more concerned with church work than we are kingdom work. There's a big difference. We'd rather have raffles and sell cakes and pies instead of participate in some type of ministry. Hello. We've had people before from this congregation. Hey, we need some help doing such and such, such and such. Here, just let me give you an offering. Well, thank you for your offering. We need it. We're going to ask you for that too. Because how many of you know money don't grow on trees? And to do ministry, it costs money. That's about half of you. But we'd rather pay somebody to do, rather, rather than to do it ourselves. We're concerned with church work, not kingdom work. Some of us have the Martha mentality. 
you know, Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, Martha was so worried about the housework that she didn't recognize that Jesus was there in the house. And, and she was more concerned about the rack of lamb in the oven. And, uh, and the fact that the, the, the lamb, you know, she, she was concerned about that rack of lamb more than she was concerned about the lamb of God that was sitting in the living room. We'd rather sacrifice chicken dinners than to give of our time, talent, and ability sometime. Are you here? And so we're so worried about getting church work done that we're missing out on getting kingdom work accomplished for the body of Christ. Gosh, this isn't in my notes, but let me go here. Some of the happiest and most blessed times that we've had in this church is whenever we'd go get that big old food truck and line it up in a park somewhere. How many of you remember those days? And during those days, people would say, you know, the people you're giving all that food to, they ain't going to come to your church. I said, it don't matter. It don't matter. We're going to give it. We're going to bless them in the name of the Lord. And we fed hundreds of people. Well, preacher, them was the good old days. Why don't we do that today? Number one reason, laborers. You got to the point, couldn't get any help. I'm busy. I got this going on. I got that going on. I got the other thing going on. I can't do that. Here, let me give you $25 though, so you can get the truck. Are you hearing me today? And I'm convinced that money always goes to ministry, but sometimes the problem is not the money. When we had the money and had the trucks coming, the problem wasn't with getting the truck or getting the people there to come and get the food. The problem was the laborers. Are you hearing me today? Some of you remember those days. You always, you always shout me down saying, Amen, preacher. That's right. That's right. But not only must we realize that, that, you see, it's more than just church work. There's church work to be done. I get it. I understand it. Thank people that help us do that. But there's kingdom work that has to be done. You know, so many people think that Sunday morning from 9.30 to 12.30 or so is a job. That, that, that That's what we do. And, and maybe give an hour or two on Wednesday nights. But, the, but, but let me tell you something. It, it's not that. Kingdom work is full-time employment. I'm not talking about just for the preachers and staff. I'm talking about you. Kingdom work. You're never off the clock. You're always working for the Lord. Somebody ought to say amen to that today. And the Bible lets us know that Satan, like a roaring lion, who is our adversary, is roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And if you know anything about lions, they're always on the prowl. They're always on the hunt. They're always seeking their prey. So if the enemy is on his job always, you should be on your job always. Now you're going to get eaten alive. If you're going to clap, go ahead and clap. Amen. Don't pity Pat. If you're going to praise God, praise Him. A laborer ought to always be ready to share in the plan of salvation, help lead someone to Christ. A, a laborer always ought to be ready to give a witness to others about the goodness of God. A laborer ought to always be ready to go out of his or her way to tell somebody who is lost and dying about the love of Jesus Christ and how they can be redeemed because Christ redeemed them with his blood on the cross. Amen. Whether there's an opportunity to share Christ with others on the job or at school or just in general conversation, we ought to always be ready to share the availability of God's love for everybody because God didn't just come and die for those who would be Pentecostal or Baptist or Methodist. He came and died for the drunk. He came and died for the whore. He came and died for the drug addict. Some of us were all right there in that same number, but we have been washed. We have been cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If we've been saved, if we've been sanctified, if we've been set apart, if we know the goodness and the grace of God, if we know the provision of God, if we know anything at all about God, that ought to propel us and motivate us into the harvest to tell others, yeah, I know it seems bad. I know you're down. I know you're out of luck. I know that all of these circumstances are against you, but let me tell you how Jesus came and lifted me up. Let me tell you how Jesus reached further down than I could reach up. Let me tell you, when I was lower than a snake's belly, whenever I had to look up to touch bottom, whenever I was in the muck and in the mire, but Jesus reached down. Oh yes, I know that it seems bad right now. I know that you're out of a 
job, out of a place to live. I know your belly's hungry, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that Jesus will lift you up and will make a way for you where there seems to be no way. And in the all of that, you can have life forever because of what he did on Calvary's cross. Let me tell you something. We have got to be willing laborers for the Lord out in the harvest. Amen. If you're going to be a laborer in the kingdom, you not only got to recognize the task, but you've also got to rely on your qualifications. Right. It's five minutes after 12 for those of you that are on medication. <laughs> Sometimes it just comes out that way. I got to go take medicine, bring some bottled water and take it while you sit in the pew. Your bottle of water, water, a cup of coffee won't bother me. Now, it may bother somebody around you, but it won't bother me. You've got to rely on your qualifications. If you're going to be a laborer for the kingdom, you've got to rely on these qualifications. The qualifications that you already possess. Look at your neighbor right now and say, you've got qualifications already to be a laborer. Everybody's got qualifications. Well, I don't know about that, preacher. How am I qualified? Let me break it down. The Apostle Peter informs us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you may give high praises unto the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He's saying that there is something different about us. We're not like everybody else. <laughs> this is a true story. <clears throat> I used to have a red shirt that I loved to wear to the point that I probably wore it out. Probably to the point that Glenn at times would wonder, don't you have anything to wear besides that red shirt? And whenever I'd go into Staples, some of you know where this is going. They'd walk up to me and say, sir, could you tell me where, sir? I said, oh, I don't work here. I just got the red shirt. I, I really don't work here. Then there were times when people say, sir, I'd be in Staples because you know, how many of you know that Staples and Menard is like Toys R Us for grown up people? <laughs> I, I, I love going into Staples and Office Max and, and, and perusing through their catalogs and wishing that I had this or that. And, and I like to go to Menards too and say, those are nice pretty tools. I don't know what they do, but they sure do look nice. <laughs> but I wear that red shirt. And it got to the point somebody said, can you tell me where? And I'd say, yeah, it's down aisle six. <laughs> Over there. I didn't work there. But just because, you know, but, but people thought because I had that red shirt that I worked there. And so that made me qualified to answer all of their questions whenever I'd be in Staples. True story. True story. And, uh, and, and, and you know something right now? Having on that red shirt didn't really qualify me as a Staples employee. I was just a consumer in there, trying to find stuff, trying to find stuff. But even though I, I, I didn't work there, there were times I was able to help people and point them in the right direction. Are you getting it? That's good. You know, you may say, Pastor, I've not been to Bible college. Pastor, I've not been to, to a seminary. Pastor, I don't, I'm not ordained. I haven't had any of this type of training. Let me ask you a question. Have you been blood bought yes. by the blood of the Lamb? Have you been saved? Has Jesus ever done anything for you? Let me tell you something. You may not think you have any qualification whatsoever, but you got the red shirt on. <laughs> You got the red shirt on, amen. And when somebody said, well, you know, 
preacher, I don't, you know, I don't know about that. Let me tell you something. You have been called. You are a chosen generation. And people, you know, I would draw like flies. It's like a magnet. There'd be other people with all kinds of red shirts on. They'd find me out and they'd migrate. And I'd say, oh gosh, here it goes again. Somebody's going to ask me for something while I'm here in Staples. And, because, and I don't know what it was. I, maybe I looked nicer than the rest of the people. Maybe because I didn't work there. I looked nicer than the rest of the people. But there was something different about me that they just wanted to come and ask me questions while I'm in Staples. Well, let me tell you something. There may be a reason why people gravitate towards you. It's because you have something different about you. There's an activating principle about you where the Holy Ghost just activates you. And then there's an attraction power. And for whatever reason, you're not looking for nobody nowhere. All at once, people just come up to you and they start talking to you. Has that ever happened to anybody besides me before? I mean, they just start talking to you. And eventually, sooner or later, most of the time, it'll come down to some type of spiritual principle. I've had people walk up to me before and after two or three minutes of talking to me, they'll look at me and they'll say, you're a preacher, ain't you? And I say, uh-huh. Years ago, when I was delivering furniture, we were delivering furniture and and, and we were at the, this person's house and they, this guy was a rough cuss. How many of you know what I'm referring to when I say that? He's just a rough cuss. And he's out there and he's blankety-blank this and blankety-blank that and everything else and I'm just standing there and, and uh, all at once, I never rebuked him. I never said, sir, watch your language. I never did any of that. I just said, I just stood there and eventually he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I thought, how does he know? Nobody has said a word. I'll tell you how he knew. It was the attracting power of the Holy Ghost that was on the inside of me. Do you know why people, this ain't in my notes, but do you know why people come up to you? Strangers. And they just start talking to you and they just did everything and you're like, what, what is it? Deodorant? Oh, what is it? I mean, do I smell? What is it? I know I'm not that pretty, amen. And yet people they just come up and they just start talking, just start talking to a total strangers. Has that happened to anybody before besides me, Kathy Gilbert? I know it happens to you all the time. Amen. And people just start talking to you and everything. He you say, oh, that's weird. I don't know why that happened. I'm going to tell you why it happened. It's the attracting power of the Holy Ghost. It's the God in you. Yeah. So you're a peculiar person. Look at your neighbor and say, you're weird. You're peculiar. You're weird. You're peculiar. <laughs> Look at the different descriptions he's used. I'm trying to quit. I promise I am. If just one person would say, preach on, I would. Preach on. That's good because if you hadn't said that, I was going to preach on anyway. <laughs> Notice the difference. He's telling us that we've been called out of darkness into light. For the purpose of being a witness. And it's because of this calling. Listen now. It's because of this calling. Of him calling you out of darkness. And into his marvelous light. That you now have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. To go into the fields and tend to the harvest. Well how do I tend to the harvest? I mean how do I become. Uh, you know how do I get involved in the harvest? You got to become a laborer. Now the word laborer comes from the Greek word engrates, which means to be a toiler and a worker. But not only that, it also means to be a teacher. He is the one who instructs others in the word, not only by teaching, but also by example. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says, Let our light shine before men so that they may see our good deeds and praise the Father who is in heaven. Our light is to cl clearly shine before men out into darkness, out into human depravity, so that others can see the example of Christ and what he has done in our lives. Not only are, are we qualified as laborers because we are chosen, but we're qualified because we got some experience in the field. We, we've got some experience in being in fields waiting for the harvest. What do you mean I've got experience being in the field waiting on the harvest? I'm going to tell you, everybody in here has got experience in the field. Oh, not me. Yes, I beg to differ with you, ma'am. I beg to differ with you, sir. You've got experience in the field. Can you prove it to me? I sure can. You ready? Every one of you got experience. You know how I know this? Because all of you ain't always been saved. 
You've been out in that harvest. Some of you is a heathen yourself. Waiting on somebody to come by and share Jesus with you. And they brought you into his marvelous light. They, somebody else harvested you. So don't tell me you don't know nothing about the harvest. You was out there in the field before yourself. Waiting on somebody. Great God, somebody help me while I preach. But because we have been saved. And because we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. We can relate to others and have compassion on those who are now scattered out in the field waiting to be harvested. The experience of sharing your faith with others will produce a spiritual, a positive spiritual result in your own life as you bless others with the word of God. And because we have blessed others with the word of God, we in turn shall be blessed of God because we're in the harvest. Somebody bless God. Amen. So not only does he want willing laborers who will recognize the task and laborers who will rely on their qualifications, but lastly, the Lord wants willing laborers who will realistically engage in the work. Because he has called you, that makes you qualified. It really does. Whom God calls, he qualifies. Because he saved you and called you, you have a responsibility. The Apostle Paul tells us, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, present our bodies as a living sacrifice because it's our reasonable service. It's the least we can do. Now the word reasonable comes from the Greek word lo, uh, lo, logitos. And it simply means logical by investigation. Because the Apostle Paul is saying here, it's your reasonable service, which means I have investigated it. Present yourselves unto God, which is your reasonable service. I've investigated. He's going to tell us why. He said, I'm, I'm calling on you to present your bodies to the Lord because it's your reasonable service. I've investigated it. And it's logical for you to present yourself to God is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is a reasonable service. It's logical. It just makes sense. As I began to meditate on that in my spirit, I couldn't help but ask, well, Brother Paul, why does it make sense? Why is it logical? Why did you investigate it? You've checked it out, and the result of your analysis is that it just makes sense, and it's logical. Paul, why is it logical that I give my all? Why is it logical that I get out into the field? Why is it logical that I put a sickle in my hand and start laboring for the Lord? Why, why is it logical? Why is it, why is it realistic for me to engage in the work of a willing laborer for the kingdom? And the answer is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Why is it logical? That I give myself to the Lord? Why is it logical that I get out in the harvest field? I want you, if you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to hear this. Why is it logical for me to get out and to labor in the harvest? What is logical? What is reasonable about that, Pastor? Paul tells us here in this passage. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which you have of God and you are not your own. That's pretty strong right there. Isn't it? What are, you, are you saying that I, I can't do my own thing? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? I'm gonna preach here a while. You've been bought with a price. Yeah, but I still got things that I want to do. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Yeah, but I'm still young and there's things I want to do and I want to sow wild oats. Yeah, but you say you're a Christian. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? But in a few years, I'll get more is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, I'll wait until I said it. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? 
I, I got to get the kids here and I got to get the kids there. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Yeah, but I've got to go here and Monday I go get this done. And Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Are you getting this today at all? You were bought with a price. You do not, you do not belong to yourself. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, it is your duty. It is your responsibility to glorify God in your body and in your spirit belong to God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. As I began to realistically engage in the work as a labor for the kingdom, as I began to give my all and all in service for the Master, I found out that even though I'm not smart, and even though I don't have a lot of education like some people do, I found out this one thing, that as I give my all and my all for his service, I found out that he is able to use me. He's able to use me. He's able to use you. I found out that he's able to use me for his glory so that others can be brought into a saving knowledge of the kingdom of God. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Who is willing to be a laborer for the Lord and to win souls for Christ? You see, when you realistically engage in the work of laboring for the kingdom, the full revelation of what Jesus says in Luke chapter 4 comes into play. You'll find that as well. As you give, you all, as you give your all for the kingdom, you'll find out too, as Jesus did, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. And He has anointed you given you power to minister to all kinds of needy souls according to the will of God. He, Spirit of the Lord is upon you and has anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor, to tell everybody about Jesus. He has, you'll find out when you give your all to the Lord that he sent you to heal the brokenhearted, those who have been truly been crushed and wounded by this world. You'll find out that as you give your 115% for the Lord, and you'll be able to proclaim liberty to the captives, those who have been enslaved by the power of sin. You'll find out that you'll be able to give recovery of the sight of the blind, those blinded by darkness, those blinded by the things the enemy does. When you give your all to the Lord, you'll find out you have a way of helping those folks to set at liberty them that are oppressed and bruised, those who are living crushed, and living shattered lives feel like there's no way of escape the Lord will help you when his spirit comes upon you and not only that you'll find out that you'll have power that the Holy Ghost has given you because he's come upon you to be witnesses what's that power for power to walk right power to talk right power to live right I'm amazed at people who don't think they can live right I don't make me preach here I really got a hobby horse here. I really do. And I'm appalled by the people who wear the, wear the banner of Christian. And they want, oh, they're quick to tell you they're Christian and they live like hell and live like the world. Well, I just can't always, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. He'll give you power to live right. That's right. I'll say that again until somebody says amen. I said the Holy Ghost yes. will give you power to live right. Power to talk right. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm going to go ahead and say it, you Facebook users. He'll give you power to post right.
Most of all, he'll give you power to be a witness for him. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that he will give you the power that you need to witness in Jerusalem, that's your neighborhood, in Judea, that's your city, Samaria, that's throughout your state, uttermost parts of the earth. You'll have power to witness even to the end of the earth. You'll have power to tell a dying world that Jesus Christ still lives. How do you know that he lives, preacher? I'm not going to try to sing it or get these boys to play it. Recently, I had a conversation with a man who said, how do you know that he, how do you know that he lives? You know what went through my head in just a split second? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply, stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, how many of you know him? Heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now sink. And I, I'm going to tell you something. When nothing else could help, the love of God and the grace of Jesus lifted me. And that's the message that the world needs to hear. The harvest is plenteous. The laborers are few. Oh, you got an outreach call? Oh, well, we can't be there. Here's 20 bucks. Go buy some candy. The laborers are few. It's not about filling a church building. That's church work. Are you saying, preacher, that you don't want a church full of people? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that's the mentality that we get. Our mentality is church work. We've got to do this church work, church work, church work. It's not church work. It's kingdom work. Man, that's good. It's building the kingdom of God. Who will join me in a renewed commitment to be a laborer in this harvest? Amen. Would you bow your hands? Father, in Jesus' name, it's been good today. We've worshipped you. We've sang some songs, some new songs. We've heard some testimonies of people who said, we didn't know what we were going to do, but God stepped in. And now, God, the challenge has been given to be a laborer in the fields, work to be done. And what we need is not to operate in survival mode, but we need to operate in revival mode. So Lord, I'm doing what Jesus told us to do. I'm praying to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers and Father, today I'm asking people to examine their heart and their life, not just to come down to an altar because everybody else is doing it, but to really examine their heart and say, you know, I really want to make a kingdom difference. I want to make a kingdom difference. You see, Lord, I, I've, I've resigned myself to know that there will always be church work to do. But sometimes we get so involved in doing church work and the repairs and this and that and the other that we forget about the real kingdom business that takes place outside of the church. 
Father, I don't mean to diminish anybody who works and does church work because we need some of that. But that shouldn't be our focus. Our focus should be on kingdom work. Touch us, Lord. And help us to be. I'll give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let us sing a little bit of that. Would you? If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Lord, I don't know how we're going to do it. 
I, I don't know where the finance is going to come from. I, I don't know any of those things. But, Father, I do know this. As sure as I'm standing here, you spoke to my heart this week. And what we need to do. Lord, I just appreciate people who will stand with us. And will be a laborer in the harvest. So, Father, we come here... And all we know at this time, God, is that there is a hunger and a passion in our heart to do something for you. To do something that might save someone from the clutches of hell. To do something that might save someone from going through maybe what we went through when you found us. And so, Father, I appreciate these folks. Father, lead us and guide us. Recognize our heart and reward that today, God. God, we don't see it in fruition right now. We only have a vision. But Father, bless us because our heart right now is in tune with you. Father, there's all kinds of people here. I really believe their heart is in tune with you. They know they need to do something. They know that their hearts have been pricked again today and they, they know God that they need to move from just church work and church stuff into real kingdom work in the hearts. I bless you for that. I thank you for that God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jerry sing one more time. Sing this with us. Let's just praise him in here.